I've used marijuana for the all past five years and find it to be probably the the best drug, if you want to call it that, in the litany of drugs that I use as far as the way I feel about having MS. I remember one gentleman was suffering, uh, had about maybe two weeks to live, um, very dreary, dark room, um, wasn't eating, gotten down to 82 pounds, and um, they brought in a brownie for him. And it was unbelievable, in about half an hour, opened his eyes and said, where's the pizza? If this were something that we just discovered in the Amazon, you know, everybody would be knocking doors down to do clinical trials to investigate its potential because it is quite an amazing medicine. In the clinic here at San Francisco General Hospital, we had uh, a volunteer, uh, Mary Rathbun, who was our volunteer of the year for two years in a row. She was an older woman and she used to bring her kids, as she called our patients, uh, marijuana brownies. Uh, this was at a time when we didn't have any effective therapies for HIV AIDS and many people were dying of the so-called wasting syndrome. I was in Amsterdam, of all places, at the International AIDS Conference and glancing at CNN headline news and I saw that Mary was being arrested in Sonoma for baking brownies for our patients. And when I arrived home, there was a letter directed to the uh, director of research in the AIDS program at San Francisco General, suggesting that a clinical trial showing the benefits of medical marijuana should come from Brownie Mary's institution, as if she were our dean. Uh, but, you know, I picked up the gauntlet and decided, well, that's a good idea. I worked as a, a clinical consultant for the elderly. I have a board certification in geriatrics and also worked for the past 25 years with hospice, helping with pain management. And that's where my passion began. I saw people uh, in their last days of their life suffering a lot from pain and other types of symptoms. And they usually had so many uh, narcotic analgesics that they were definitely not even lucid and really couldn't have a good quality of life before they passed away. And so many people asked about marijuana, how they could get it, and so usually I had to tell them, this is 15 years ago, that 20 years ago, that they need to talk with their friends' children or adolescents and they could probably help them. Unfortunately, there was no way to find out what it was or what type of cannabis they were using, but the results of using cannabis were just dramatic. My eyes shake because of the MS which I had at that time, unbeknownst to me, because I hadn't been diagnosed at that time. But my eyes were shaking, and if I'd smoked marijuana, it slowed down my shaking eye, and I could study. And so I got through junior college well enough to be accepted at Texas A&M. That, and the fact that I played a little football. When I left Texas A&M and got into the industry as an engineer, I quit smoking marijuana altogether. I, I was a... Uh, uh, coat and tie every day at work. We came out here in about 1980, 81, and began designing offshore platforms when my balance continued to get worse out here in California. And because my job required that I climb the derricks, my balance was a major issue safety-wise. Through that scenario, I was diagnosed with MS at about 1982, 81, 1981. Cannabis, the plant, uh, has a number of active compounds called cannabinoids, and they belong to a family of 21 carbon chemicals that all have um, biologic activity. We believe that there are about 70 or 80 different cannabinoids in marijuana. And what investigators found in the 1970s and 80s was that uh, we have receptors in our body, uh, CB1 and CB2, uh, that complex with these cannabinoids from the plants. Now why would we, and all other animal species, mind you, have these CB1 receptors? It's not because we're meant to smoke marijuana. What we find out is that 
we have uh, our own circulating cannabinoid chemicals in our body that don't come from the plant. They're generally produced on demand and they complex with the receptor and they cause uh, biological action. We're working on a product now um, in a lollipop or lozenge form that's high in delta-8 THC instead of delta-9. And when we were extracting, we came up with that and said, you know, what is delta-8? And we found that delta-8 is about 50% as potent as THC, so it causes less of the, the euphoric, euphoric effects, but it's 200 times more potent in uh, helping with nausea and vomiting. So it's a great product for our patients undergoing chemotherapy. I think most of the interest now is on another uh, cannabinoid called cannabidiol, otherwise known as CBD. <clears throat> this cannabinoid seems to have really potent anti-inflammatory and anti-pain activity without having a psychological effect or without producing a high. As an oncologist, there's hardly a cancer patient that I see for whom I don't recommend cannabis. Because these are patients, especially those who are undergoing chemotherapy, who benefit from anti-nausea, increased appetite. We have many, many other anti-nausea drugs, but cannabis is the only drug that also increases appetite. And we know it decreases pain, again, especially in conjunction with opioids, helps people sleep better, and it decreases depression. So those are five reasons that a cancer patient might benefit from cannabis, and if I were not familiar with cannabis's medicinal properties, I would have to prescribe five different medicines, all of which would have side effects, toxicity, and cost. I'm probably um, under the care of, oh, eight drugs right now, uh, injections and oral tablets, and, uh, and they're all preventative. You, you, you don't really feel the effects, but you ought to see the downsides on the bottle. The bottles will scare you to death. Like I'm on one drug for the multiple sclerosis for spasticity. It's called, what is this? What's oh, the name? It's that one, the baclofen. Uh, is baclofen. And part of the problem with baclofen is that it makes you tired. It's kind of a downer. So they, then they gave me, uh, what is this? Dextroamphetamine. Dextroamphetamine to counteract the sleepiness of this. I'll see what we have here. Effexor, this is an antidepressant. Now I'm not sure whether they make me antidepressed or not. That's, a, that's kind of an attitude that, and having MS is depressing. But I can say one thing, of all the drugs that I do take, the only one that really seems to affect my day-to-day -day attitude and uh, point of view is uh, marijuana. When I worked in a pharmacy, if somebody called and said they had overdose, we would immediately call 9-11 and the paramedics. Um, the good thing if we get a call that a person is over-medicated with cannabis, we tell them to sit down, drink lots of water, eat, and those symptoms of dizziness and um, out of control will subside in a couple of hours. So that's, that's the beauty of cannabis. It's much safer. You know, I've been a doctor now for 30 some years and the number of patients that I've admitted to the hospital with complications related to marijuana use was exactly one. When I was an intern in 1978, uh, somebody smoked cannabis laced with PCP and had a psychotic reaction. The number of patients I've admitted with complications due to alcohol is enormous. So, you know, I, yeah. I think we need to reevaluate uh, what we do in this country, and it's, it's all politics and economics. The nose of the camel is already in the tent, and it's because of uh, videos like this and questions being asked about this drug, how it's utilized, how it affects the just the nine to five of my day. The biggest thing that we can do is work towards changing the schedule of cannabis and out of the schedule one. Schedule one obviously says there's no medicinal value. And we all know 
doctors, physicians, researchers, pharmacists, patients know that there is incredible medicinal value.